All right, so um, first off, I'm just double checking. Can everybody hear me in the back? Okay, so um, again, next Tuesday, we will have a quiz again on um, basically um, ex on expressions and evaluations and, and the like. We might decide, I might decide to do an in-class exercise depending on how far we get, and that will count as a quiz grade. But um, also, with I'm, uh, I got a bunch of useful emails uh, over the course of yesterday saying, hey, uh, I'm not getting points on this runestone exercise. So not just you if you sent me that email or if you got like eight out of nine points on something. I will check that out um, Again, this is my first time using this uh, text, this online textbook. Uh, again, it's free, so I'm hoping that basically some minor frustrations like that will be completely offset by the fact that you do not have to pay for, for a couple hundred dollars for a textbook. So, um, now, yes. How do we know when the exercise is? Uh, it should be under. So, um, that's an excellent question. Um, but if you go over to your little the icon of, I guess, you over here, and hit the assignments button. Well, it says this, I'm, I'm not logged in, so let me log in. And then if you go to your assignments, it will say do over here. And that just simply set it up. So that's like in five days. Plenty of time. Um, a lot of stuff you just have to simply click, I read it, yes. Um, so on your honor then. Um, and a lot of stuff are, and then others, so like when it's a reading like this stuff over here, you want to read those and then tell me you read them. And then do these exercises over here um, and get scored on them. So, um, but for the most part, these should be fairly easy to do. They're worth 5% of your grade. And mainly what we're looking for is at the end of semester, Okay, did the student attempt it? Um, did the student attempt most, uh, 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 at least try to do them, even though they got most of them wrong? Three points out of five. Did them and got, and did them and got them mostly right, then they'll probably get five points, right? Three to four points if you got them mostly wrong, if, you know, depending on your effort. And then if you didn't do any of it, then it's zero. So that's, it's a very informal grading system for these. Basically, just do them and try your best on them. All right, so last week, so last, not last week, but on Tuesday, we, were, we went over basically a lot of stuff, um, which was simply the elements of, pro, uh, of this. We'll get into more detail about those selection statements and those um, if statements, uh, so the selection if statements and the for loops later. Right now with the for loops, re and the for loops, to be honest, they're both harder, some of them are harder than, than the if statements and some of them are easier than the if statements. When they're in the format of, of like this, then you know that do something is gonna be performed 10 times, right? That's, the, that's when it's easy. When, when you see something like this, you know it's gonna be perform 10 times. Right now, I don't need you to learn how to write them. I'm not going to expect you to write them for a while, but I might use them just to simplify things. Um, but right now, what I wanted to dive into was modules. Um, right, so in Python, uh, and so this corresponds with chapter four in the textbook, and I'll assign more readings tonight. Um, chapter four or goes over, kind of gives a brief overview of modules. And the idea here is that um, Python, if you check out one of the links in, in the syllabus, um, has documentation. Let's go to the table of contents over here. Python documentation for 3.3. Let's go ahead and check out 3.7. Doesn't really change too much. Documentation remains mostly the same. So here, Python 3.x documentation. What's new? They have a tutorial for learning Python, so hey, if you're stuck on something and want some more resources, again, this is also listed in the syllabus, um, which goes over short things, and it's a small textbook of its own. Um, it may imply that, you, it may think that you already have stuff, uh, already have some knowledge, uh, 
but that's perfectly fine for some of the for some of the concepts. But what's cool is this library reference, which it says to keep under your pillow. Um, of course, um, if you do keep it under, let's see, it's the standard library, and if you do keep this under your pillow, you might get a um, like some neck pain because it's quite large, actually. Um, yeah, so, so let's see, ints. So these are all things that are in the Python language. So Boolean operators, comparisons, numeric types, iterators, sequence types, list strings and tuples, sorry, lists, tuples, and ranges, then text sequences, bytes, all this stuff. Date, time, calendar, collections. Why would I need a calendar and date time? We'll learn about that in a second. Uh, so we'll learn about that actually in upcoming weeks. It turns out that keeping track of time is a non-trivial task, especially when you have to account for things like time zones um, and uh, things like leap seconds. Yeah, that's a thing. Um, so there's also math, CMath, numbers, all these things. Now, most of these you are never going to touch. Don't no need to. I've never really used pickle before. Um, I know what it is, but I've never really used it. I've never used CMath, which is math for complex numbers. You're not really going to need it unless you're dealing with complex numbers. But the idea here is that if you need to write something that's dealt with complex numbers, uh, first off, complex numbers are kind of, you know, they're annoying to deal with, right? Anybody think they're slightly non-trivial, slightly difficult to mess with? Yeah. Complex numbers are kind of real, uh, really annoying. So why would I write program for it when it's very easy for me to make a mistake? Why should I write, uh, write, that, uh, write a bunch of stuff that deals with complex numbers when instead I can use something that was designed by a bunch of people, checked by a bunch of people, and as a result, I know it's going to work. And they probably implemented it better than I could, in the sense that it's much more efficient. So the idea here is that there's these libraries, these modules that exist that do a bunch of basic things that, um, that, you, um, that a lot of programmers need. Programmers hate, rebuilding, or re hate redesigning the wheel. So instead, we just simply copy somebody else's code. Um, it's the same. Good programmers take uh, good programmers write good code. Great programmers steal great code, um, but don't actually steal code because that's actually going to be really bad for you. Um, the idea here also, you shouldn't do it when you don't know what you're doing because uh, it's very easy to basically accidentally copy paste the security vulnerability into your server and then, oops. Um, for instance. Um, Let's see. Um, remember program. Uh, yeah. So, for instance, uh, ah, yes, that's what it's called. Couldn't remember the name, but I can remember what it was called. What that was called a wabbit sometimes, a fork bomb, for instance. Um, let's see. Do they have it in Python? Yeah, so this looks innocuous, and you might think, oh, copy-paste this in. If I copy-paste this code and run it on my computer, it will then proceed to lock up all my computer's resources uh, because what it will do is that it will produce clones of itself, and, continue, and basically each of those clones will produce more clones of itself, and so on and so forth. That's why it's called a fork bomb, because it uses the fork process to create clones of itself. Um, that... Um, it can be, also if you're running a Mac, it can be um, rendered like this, and then you can put it in like that, and if it supports Unicode, it can be rendered like this, which is really explicit because it's got little tiny bombs in there. That's actually kind of cute. Um, oh, and if your Windows, you're not safe, but that's fine. Um, this also works. Um, right, so don't copy paste uh, and run code that you don't understand is the point being. Um, that being said, the stuff in the standard library is perfectly safe to run. Um, so how do you use this code that somebody else has written? Um, the way we do that is we import it. 
we use the import keyword um, in Python. So here I've imported the turtle module without the, um, so here, right, if I run this, um, what do you mean it has no attribute forward? Oh, I know what I did. My bad. All right, so there, I've got my turtle, he moves forward, right? I've imported turtle, made him move forward, and he also increased the size of his, of his pen so you can see it. But if I remove this turtle, this import turtle, I get an error, turtle is not defined. Now the reason for this is that I have to import turtle. I have to tell Python I would like to use the code that's been programmed in turtle um, that's in the Python standard library. Okay, so now why do I have to import it? Why can't I just use it? The reason being is that there's, if you hadn't, seen, if you hadn't gotten the idea, there's tons of this stuff. Some of this stuff is actually quite big. Um, and it would actually be a lot, very onerous to load it all up for a program that's not going to use it. Why would I need the server code, you know, Python server code for a little program that's going to draw little things? That really doesn't make any sense. So here, what we're going to do is we're just going to import the turtle. The turtle. And we're saying we, we just want the turtle. We want nothing else other than the turtle and the basic Python stuff, the for loops, the length statement, the if statement, those kind of things. So turtle, so that's why we've got to import turtle. There's other things uh, as well that we can import. Uh, another common one is that the book goes over is random, which is pretty fun. Uh, you can also import things over here, import random. Um, I forget how to use random, it's all because, mainly because it's different in different languages. I know how to, so let's see, control F random, right? Random, pseudo random numbers. Source code. Interesting thing about Python, you can check the source code out. Like right over here. And it's there and it's got basically how people wrote it. Turns out generating random numbers are pretty tricky. And I'll get into that in a second. Also note that I didn't that actually it's never saying that it's random numbers, it's pseudo random numbers. We'll get into that in just a second. But import random. And again, the reason okay, yeah, random dot randint. Turn a random integer that. So, if I wanted to simulate like rolling a six-sided dice, a uh, six-sided die, I could do random dot rand int one six, and it will return a random number between one and six. Right, a random int. Now, you might think, well, that's not really random. It's giving the favor one and, oh, there's a three. Well, actually, remember, here's the thing about randomness. It doesn't mean that everything's going to come out even. It means that it's going to be fairly even after we do like a million of these, right? We don't have a statistical, a good statistical sample size. Um, it does say that it's going to be um, fairly, um, yeah, should be, fairly sophisticated about producing uh, equal, evenly distributed va values. So now what did it mean to be pseudo-random? Um, so true randomness on a computer is impossible. Impossible to get true random numbers. And that gets into the, con and actually if we get into, if we were to borrow a philosophy professor or something, you might get one who argues that there's nothing truly random in the universe because everything is, a cause, is caused by something else, which is caused by something else, which is caused by something else. To which we go, we're, we're engineers. We don't want to deal with any kind of philosophy. We just want to get our work done. Um, but it's actually an interesting question to consider. Um, so what we aim for in mathematics and computer science is statistically random. In other words, if, I, if we were playing a game of chance, would it be a fair game of chance, right? If we were to make a betting game, right, and say, hey, I bet that this number is going to come up on one, well, I lose. But the question is, was it a fair toss of the die? 
was there an equal chance of me getting a one, of it landing on one as there was on a two, three, four, or five, or six? That's what we're aiming for. Basically, is the randomness even, if we have a bunch of numbers, are they evenly distributed? And can, we, can it not be predicted by the user? That's what we go for. So that's what we do for these. Um, there's also different types of distributions, right? I'm talking about a uniform distribution where everything's even, but we also have um, normal distributions or the bell curve, right, where you want a distribution for like something where, where, where people's heights end up, that's going to end up in a bell curve, right? So those kind of distributions. But random's a useful code. It generates random numbers. Um, what's interesting, though, is because it's pseudo-random, what we have is a seed. So a seed is basically the saying, is basically a way of forcing the random numbers to run the same every single time. So let's go ahead and just simply put a, do that in a script. So edit shell, uh, restart it first. I'm going to restart that shell. I'm going to go ahead and again adjust this. So new. All right. So I'm going to also show you something you do not want to do when you're writing something. So I want to show you how I'm doing something. How I'm doing something. I'm, I want to show you how to write a pro, how to use the random module. So I figure I'll just call this random.py. Import random. And now. Um, Print random dot rand int uh, one to fifty. Print number one through fifty. Um, now run this. This should not work. Yeah, when it froze on me. Great. Okay, that's actually it's not not often that I that I, that I like um, crashing my program, but that was actually intended behavior there. Um, and the reason it crashed was because I wanted to import something called random. Let's see. So I was writing this program called random. Oh. That did not open in idle. Whew. Did I just bork idle? Fun if I did. That's okay if I did. I'll move over to a different, to my other editor. Ah, uh, okay, something's blocking it, it says. Yeah, it's just, it just is not what to know what to do with the fact that I just did something there. Okay. Oh, good. New. So let's go ahead and open that again. So, first off, the question is, is that when you do the import statement, a lot of things actually happen there. The first thing it does is that it checks the current directory where the, where the file is saved and looks for uh, a program named whatever, you, what, named whatever you put here. So uh, this looks for a program, so this looks for a program, a Python program called random.py. Well, I just happened to write one. It's this file which will also go and look for random.py, which will also go and look for random.py, and so on and so forth, right? So the import says, look, first thing I want to do is check the current directory and look for the program. Then if it doesn't find it there, then it says, ah, you must mean you want to use a, one, of the, one, of the, uh, one of the Python libraries. So I'm going to go and check if there's a Python library named random. So it does that um, next. But because I've named my program random, it thinks, ah, you want to use this one. Now, what happens is that whenever you import something, it runs the code. So, for instance, um, over here, if I, were, I, if I were to, let's go ahead and open up my hello program. Um, let's see, hello. Let's see. There we go. Bum, 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 bum. 
Whoops, no, don't wanna, don't wanna turn off my computer. Okay, the issue with, with the power button is like another key. So, um, let's just write a quick hello world program. Hello world dot pi print hello world print done all right now if I run this sorry so if I run this that will print out if I go over here and ran back into random.py and if I instead decide to import hello world that's perfectly fine and if I run it run module hmm Does not do those. Import hello world. Internal. Ah, okay. That's fine. Point being is that it will run this code even though it doesn't print it out. I'll have to check why it doesn't do that. But the point being is that it executes the code. So when we go back to our random, over here, when we had import random, it was telling it then to import random, which would import random, which would import random, and so on and so forth. So the end of the day is um, when you're running a program, when you're writing a program, don't name it the same thing as what you're trying to import. You don't have to know what everything else is called. You don't have to know that basically there's a C math or a math. Just know if that there's if you're going to be importing math, don't call your program math. If you're going to be importing turtle, don't call your program turtle. That was a nasty bug I, dis I discovered last semester. And so I figured that, or by I discovered, I mean I s a student accidentally discovered it and I spent about 10 minutes trying to figure out what was going on. And then I noticed that the file name was named turtle and was like, oh, that might be the reason. And it was. So um, let me go ahead and delete this file. Um, and then we're actually going to talk about how to use turtles because that will actually be fun. Um, so let me delete this so that when I use random numbers in the future, I'm not going to get an error. Okay. So turtles now. Turtle. Mm -hmm. So turtles are covered in. So believe it or not, yes, I know I'm going. To, slightly fast, but I basically hit over the big points that I wanted to in chapter four, which is that, uh, or part four of this, which is Python modules. And you'll notice it's actually quite small, going over how to import modules, the random module. Really though, what we want to do is go over the turtle. Now, um, you can go over the turtle program here, or, or you can do the turtles in here, in your textbook. Um, the big thing to know about turtles, though, um, not the big thing, but like if you're running a Mac, some older Macs, like I had this like last year, some older Macs have some issues with the libraries that tur Turtle uses, and so when they try to import it, they get an error. If that's the case, just do your code, you know, in here because this will be able to run your Turtle code. Um, and there's quite a number of good exercises here, but let me go ahead and go over uh, the turtle stuff. So importing turtle uses the turtle code. Now when we're working with turtles, the first thing we want to do is create a new turtle. I call my turtle, I generally call my turtle Bob because that's a very short name. Um, and, it, and it's just easy to give it a name like that. This first line over here is the first thing we have to do whenever we're writing a turtle program, which creates a new turtle. Turtle.turtle, .turtle, this is just code that creates a new turtle object. And if we were to run this code on your computer, which you can, um, let's see. Yeah, I think it's just a problem with idle because of, the, because of what I did with random. So that's what's going on there. So, um, yeah, okay, now it's working. And that will just create a little arrow, right? It's a bit hard to see, especially if you're in the back, but it's a tiny little arrow. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say I'm going to use a function I looked up right before class started. Um, shape size 
let's see, stretch, uh, 4.0, 4.0, and that should make him, oh, that looks much better, right? Much better. I think I can maybe shrink him a little bit. Everybody can see him in the back now, right? No, right? Yeah, so I'm going to totally shrink him a little bit, maybe to a three and a three. So turtle, as we can see, is actually fairly powerful. Um, so there's my turtle. Um, you can actually make him invisible. There's also a lot of shapes you can make him. I like, because we're dealing with turtles, I like his actual shape to be dot shape to be a turtle. Now, a turtle is an object. That means he's like an actor in this program. He's a noun in the, li in the Python language. It means he can perform actions. And for Bob to perform actions, we say dot, and then we call whatever action he wants to do. We invoke a function that he has. There's two types of functions you really have in Python. The first are standalone functions like, um, that we've seen here, like print, right, which will print something out. There's also functions that are um, like length, which given a string, will tell you how many characters are in the string, right? Those are standalone functions. Um, objects like Bob, they can do stuff by saying, uh, you know, dot action that I want to perform. Uh, these actions are sometimes called methods in other languages, um, but you'll hear me use function or method interchangeably here. But, the, but there's a list of all these actions that, um, that Bob can perform. Um, and they're, again, they're in the documentation. Right, over here, forward, FD, backward, back, or back, right, left, go to, set position, set X, X y, set Y, set hudding, uh, home, circle, dot, stamp. How many of these do you think you need to memorize for like an exam I'll give you? The answer is forward, right turn, left turn, and stamp. Will probably be the ones that you'll eventually need to know for an exam. Those are really the only important ones you'll need for an exam. How to go forward, how to go back, sorry, how to go forward, how to turn left and right, and stamp's kind of useful, as you'll eventually see, but. All right, so we've got our turtle, and now we've given him the shape of a turtle, right? And as I mentioned, He's got a little pen attached to his tail that he's just going to drag around. Okay? We can move him forward just by telling him to go bob.fd and, and we tell him how many pixels he'd like to move forward. So 50. That's not going to move very much for a big turtle, you know. But <coughs> that's fine. We can also have him change his heading. bob.write. 90 degrees, which will turn him right 90 degrees. Move forward, turn right. That moved a little fast, actually. Can we slow him down? Of course we can. So um, how do we do that? Let's see. Speed, that seems good. Zero is the fastest. One is the slowest, and slow is three. So let's go ahead and slow him down to slow. And we'll put that command first, bob.speed. <laughs> three, right, and let's go ahead and see how, how, oh, that was actually still pretty quickly, so let's go ahead and turn that down to one. There we go. Let's go ahead and have him move him ahead, like, uh, 500 steps now, as opposed to that, and then turn 90, so we can see it in a bit more detail. Move forward 500. Oh, 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 oh. Huh. So he's not limited by the screen size. How interesting. Good to know. That is actually something I knew, but better to see you, see uh, for you to see these things first off. Um. All right. What else can we do with him? Um, Bob. That speed. So let's. So, is there a limit to how much he can turn? So let's do twenty ninety degree turns. 
So again, he's going to go off screen. And if we tell him to do uh, uh, 20, 90 degree turns, he's going to get quite dizzy. But that's perfectly fine. Um, and yet, so remember, with turning around, of course, it works just as you would expect for something turning around, which is that if you turn more than 360 degrees, you're going to end up back where you started, right? Um, oh, and just like you can move, you can turn right. You can turn left. Right, and this is the primary way you can maneuver the turtle. You tell him to turn in a direction, and then you tell him to go forward again. Or so here, we're going to tell him to go. Uh, so let's go ahead and tell him to turn 90 degrees. Here, we're going to move, let's say, 200. Turn 90 degrees. And then turn 90 degrees as well. 90, turn 90. And then he turned left, and he's going the back, the original orientation that he started. Something that I'm interested in. What if I asked him to turn negative 90 degrees? What would happen then? Can you turn negative 90 degrees? So negative 90 degrees left is 90 degrees to the right, which is confusing, and I'm never going to do that to you. Uh, but it's worthwhile to know if basically the reason if you that, that that's not going to give you an error. Um, now, let's see, what other things can we do? So we can also teleport the turtle home, bob.home. Move, turn, move, turn, and home. Moves him back home, which is the center of the screen, and turns him back into the proper orientation. Right, home was the last command, and he turned on home. Also, notice that when he went back home, it drew. So, this also with it also said here that home is zero zero, which means that this is actually a coordinate plane. So, and there's a set x and set y. So, let's see if we can't use that. So, again, I'm just playing around here trying to show you these things. So, Bob dot set um, position. I think it was set, uh, set pause is equal to move the turtle to an absolute position. Nice. Thanks for the documentation. We're going to move him to 50-50. Then, Bob dot set pause negative 50 50 and see what happens there oh that went quick ah I removed my speed is equal to 1 bob dot speed 1 so he moved to 50 50 then he moved to negative 50 50 so it's the coordinate plane that we'd expect. It's just unmarked, unfortunately. Um, OK. Now, he draws when, he, when we go back home. Interestingly enough, though, we can also do pen up. So now watch what happens. Draw, draw, pen up. And there's no line there. So right, remember, he's got a little pen attached to his tail. So pen up, pen down will drop the will will basically um, drop add and drop the pen. So let's go ahead and just let's see Bob dot forward. Honestly, the hardest part of turtle is remembering how to spell forward. That's really the hardest part. Let's copy and paste this in, and then what I'm going to do is Bob dot uh, peb, a pen, uh, pen up. Have him move forward 50. Pen down. Pen up. Pen down. Right, 
and now we've got, got him doing dashes. Right? Another, now I mentioned another command, which is um, now I'm going to have him put his pen up entirely. And I'm going to make use of the for loop again. For, um, it doesn't matter, in range five. So this means whatever code is inside of here is going to be repeated five times, right? Again, not expecting you to know how to write a for loop yet. So they're not particularly hard. They're just, again, something I haven't gone into depth of how they, uh, on how they work. But what I did tell you is that the end result is that this means that whatever's indented here will run five times. So what we're going to do is tell Bob is going to move forward five spaces. And why am I doing a for loop then? Because I'm lazy and I don't want to have to type it multiple times. So I'm going to just do, I think I'm going to uh, shrink Bob down to twice his original size as opposed to three times. So bob.forward50, bob.stamp. And we'll see what that does. So stamp, let's go ahead and, um, and now here's why it's in the loop, because I can actually change this to be a bit, and now there's more distance between his stamps. What a stamp does is that um, he, is that stamps, basically imagine he's also got a bunch of ink right underneath him on his shell, and now he's just doing a little belly flop onto the ground, right? So he's essentially creating a stamp of himself on, on here, which is pretty useful because you can also, because you can actually, one of the things we will do when we do the Hurricane Tracker program is that we will give him a custom defined shape. Yes? He leaves a stamp whenever we call stamp. So what he does is that he moved forward 100 steps, then he stamped. So what we'll go, yeah, so he moves forward 100, stamps down. 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 And notice that he's like on his last stamp. Let's go ahead and move him off of his last stamp. Um, Bob.color red. Um, Bob.right. Um, 90, Bob dot forward, um, 100. So now he's going to turn right and move down off the last stamp. And I'm also going to make him red. Again, let's see, go ahead and see if there's a way to adjust that screen because we keep going off the side of it. Let's see. Uh, I believe there is. Pretty sure that it shows me over here. Turtle.screen creates a graphics window. Control F, right. And this is a lot of how programming works. You're like, oh, I wonder how to do this. Turtle screen, screen size. Let's see. Let's see. Turtle dot screen size. Let's see. Ah, well, all it did was at was add scroll bars to this, so not particularly useful there. Um, that's fine. I can always just shrink it back to, um, yeah. Let's go ahead and shrink the turtle some more, 1.5, and have him move forward 50. Okay, moves forward five, he stamps, turn red, right? For that last turn, right, what we've got over here in the for loop is that we're telling him to move forward 50 steps, then stamp down. Move forward 50 steps, stamp down. Move forward 50 steps, stamp down. Move forward 50 steps, stamp down. 
move forward 50 steps and stamp down. So he's moved forward 55 times and stamped each of those times. Then we have, th so now we're done with the for loop, right? Because what the for loop said is just simply repeat this thing five times. Then we tell him to become red, do a right turn, and move forward 50 steps so that we can distinguish him from the rest of the, to, uh, from the, rest of the turtles. Um, interestingly enough, if I tell him to bob.stamp, actually, let's go ahead and see. Can I, can I use um, this? Can I use the idle to do it? Um, bob.stamp. Yes, I can. Bob dot forward. So I can control him. Oh, soon I have to actually, again, is that the hardest part is making him move? Bob dot forward 50. So notice what I did there. I said, tell Bob to stamp over here. And then told Bob to move forward. Right? Now, why could I do it in here, in this thing? Well, whenever you run a program, right? Especially in idle, what makes idle really awesome is that whenever you run a program in, in here, you run the module and it switches over to running it in this Python shell, which means that all the variables that you just created, all the imports you just did, this does it silently. Um, and then that means that if you want to debug your program like I just did by moving him forward a bit and by stamping him and then move forward, moving him forward a bit, I can. Um, if we want to see what our drawing looks like without Bob, um, can we turn him invisible? Notice that uh, actually a drop menu just came down over here dot, after I hit dot. It's very small to see for the people in the back. Even for the people in the front, it's very small. But when you hit dot on an object, you can actually, um, you can actually get a list of all the functions that that object can do. So is visible seems promising. Um, that's a bit hard to see again. Is visible seems promising. So Bob is visible. Returns true if this, ah. So yes, he's visible. So can I do bob.set visible? Has no attribute set visible. So control F visible. Again. Oh, I'm looking for whole word. That's the reason. I was having trouble finding stuff. Visible. Show turtle, hide turtle. Nice. Oops. Oh, right. It's all lowercase. Bob, and I said turtle, not Bob. Bob dot hide turtle. There we go, and Bob just disappeared. Um, what if I told him to stamp while he's hidden? Oh, what went wrong there? What did I forget to do? Yes. Yeah, I forgot parentheses, right? So in order to invoke a method, and we call it invoke, I think, because it makes it a sound really cool, like we're wizards or something. Um, so bob.stamp with parentheses, even though he was invisible, he was able to stamp, right? The hiding the turtles just make it so you can't see him. Um, and this is useful if you're actually just drawing something, you know. So that's pretty nice. Um, and this is true even if we do um, bob dot uh, pen down. Bob dot FD, that's short for forward, 100, right? And now we just, and now Bob's over here, right? We just can't see him, right? But we can see where he's been. Also, he's red now. Why is he red? Because earlier I told him to be red. Let's go ahead and show Bob again. Uh, Bob dot show turtle. I know it's show turtle because I just saw it. Okay, right, there he is. Bob dot color. Um, green. Cool, I can make him green. Bob dot um, color. Blue. Bob dot color pink. 
pink a thing? I guess so. Bob.color puce? Is that a color? I don't know. It's like, doesn't know what it is at that point though. So here's the thing. So let's talk about color for a second. So first off, there's a couple ways we can do, we can control color. Uh, color, there's two colors the turtle, ha the turtle has, the pen color and the fill color. Um, let's see, easiest to show them. Color just sets them both and most of the time you don't really care about, uh, unless we're talking about both of them. So, uh, so here, let's go ahead and say, uh, Bob dot set fill, Bob dot fill color blue. Now watch what happens to our pink turtle. Okay, a bit hard to see, but we've got a turtle with a, a blue turtle with a tiny hint of a red, of a pink outline. We can take a look at that by doing the bob dot um, set shape, right, 1.5, 1.5. And then we can add a per third parameter, I think, for the outline, two. Shape size. Bob dot shape size. One point five. One point five. And then three. Okay, and now I made the outline much bigger. So you can see that he's got blue because we set his fill color to blue and then his pen size and then his pen color is pink, which is represented by its outline. So let's see what so let's see what happens with that. Bob dot FD one hundred. So his color that he drags along the ground is going to be whatever his outline is. But if I tell him to stamp, bob.stamp, okay, and then bob.ht for high turtle, it's going to be exactly what you see. So you can set his outline as well as what his color is. Generally, though, you just simply say bob.color. That's the only one you really need to remember. Um, okay, but what if and Bob dot st for show turtle? But what if you don't want one of the predefined colors? So there it says there's three things you can do. You can do color string or color RGB. <coughs> All right. So let's see, color, we can set it like this. We can also set color like this. What? What the heck is this? Does anyone happen to know? Anybody work in graphics or anything? Yes. Is it like color code or something? Yeah, that is color code. That is hexadecimal. Yes. Yes. Uh, what are those, what do those numbers represent? Anyone? Yeah. Something like that. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's what I was looking for. RGB. That was the magic word. Not, um, not RBG. Ruth Gator. Uh, not, you know, not Ruth Gator Ginsburg, but uh, but RGB. Um, red, green, blue. Um, so what, but as you were saying, these are 16 digit numbers, oh sorry, 16 bit numbers. So this is a number over here, which represents how much red. This is a number over here that represents how much green. This is a number over here that represents how much blue. This is actually, it translates to a number between, this over here translates to a number between zero and, two, and 256, um, which is the maximum amount a byte has. But at the end of the day, I don't necessarily know if Turtle actually does it that way. I think Turtle actually has a much 
easier way for you to represent these things. Um, so Bob dot color, right? And then you say color. Let's see. Let's see Bob dot color, and then you can give it what's called a tuple, something we get into in the next chapter. Um, let's say three three three. Bad color sequence. Okay, so for colors, it needs to be Bob dot color, and I think this will work. One one zero. Okay. So there's two color modes for this. Let's see. So let's see. Bob dot color. So let's play around with this. One, zero, zero. So one is red, I guess. Or the first one is red. Okay? Go ahead and set zero and one over here. Let's go ahead and do all zeros. Interesting, zero is black. So what should three ones be, would you say? White. So if I do zero, one, one over here, what am I gonna get? I get a cyan color. So Let's go ahead and go back to doing one at a time. One was red. This is green. And this is blue. You can mix these together for certain intensities. Red and blue. Red plus blue gives us a purple. Right? But what's with the ones and zeros? Well, that's the color strength. So, for instance, if I say one red and half a blue, it gives me a color halfway. Uh, it gives the blue, I'm saying have the blue at half strength. If I, if I allow, lower this down to half strength, we get more of a brownish color. And what about half blue and half red? It gets us a much darker purple. So you can kind of vary these colors. You can pretty much come up with any color combination you need, which is pretty cool. Um, if you prefer to work in this classic RGB mode, um, you can do. You can check the. You can set the color mode, I believe, to be to be um, two hundred to go. Yeah, to do two hundred fifty six. Um, you can also use the hexadecimal notation as well, but. Essentially, you can go any color you need, which means we can pretty much do a lot of different kinds of drawing in here with the turtles. All right. So I'll, let me go ahead and let's see. So, so the turtles are actually pretty awesome. Um, now, of course, um, there's been just one problem. Uh, Bob has been kind of lonely, in my opinion. So let's go ahead and make Alice a turtle. Alice is equal to, now, in case you're wondering why I chose those names, Alice and Bob, those are classic uh, computer science names for examples for people. Uh, it's typically like Alice, Bob, Carol, and then, uh, you know, or Carl, depending, and then D D is going to be either Dan or Donna, or depending on who it is. But it was always Alice and Bob for the first two, for like the example people names. Um, the only other one that's like set in stone, I think, is Malicious Mallory, who's generally a bad actor. Um, why people chose Malicious Mallory should be fairly straightforward in the name, but generally she's the one who's generally trying to be like a hacker or breaking, in, or breaking into your system and messing things up. Or it could be malicious Malcolm, I suppose, but same concept applies there. Turtle uh, dot turtle. So we can create a new, we can have more than one turtle. So let's go ahead and create Alice. Oh, look, I did that and uh, we got a new arrow over here, right? Let's go ahead and uh, increase the size on Alice. Set, sh uh, or shape size, right, to increase it. 
And you don't normally need to do that in your programs. I'm just doing it over here for the people who are not me who can't get up and close and see that, you know? Right, so now it's an arrow. Um, I'll go ahead and keep her an arrow so that we can uh, just simply distinguish her. But you can move, move these turtles basically kind of in tandem. Not necessarily at the same time, but in the sense that basically we can, um, we can, you know, control them both. Uh, Alice dot left, nine, uh, 180 degrees. Alice dot, let's write a for loop. Four, I in range three. Alice dot forward 100. Alice dot forward uh, dot left 120 degrees. What's that going to do? It's going to go four, three times. One, then turn left 120 degrees. So first off, first thing I need to an answer is that, oh, I'm going turning left 120 degrees three times. What's three times 120? 360. So this is going to end up being a full turn. So move forward, then go one, left 120, which is slightly more than 300. That's slightly more than, um, than a 90 degree turn. We do that three times, we draw a triangle. Right, so you can get multiple turtles working uh, on stuff if you need to. Um, right, and here's like one that they have for us, right? You can draw multiple things. Um, so you can have multiple turtles that are active at the same time. Or rather, you can have multiple turtles alive on the board at the same time, but they won't act at the same time because you can only give commands to one at a time. Okay. So any questions so far on turtles? Yes? Oh, because I had, because the first thing I had her do was, tr was this command, Alice left 180. So I had her turn this way. Oh, why does it go right as opposed to up in the beginning? Uh, that's just the default way that it's set up, that all pro that the turtles are facing this way as opposed to up. How do I make it go up? In the beginning? Or how do I make it go up, period? In the beginning? In the beginning? Um, you can set the default way a turtle is by, let's see. So I remember that being... Um, so orientation, set heading. Yeah, there is a setting for it in here that you can um, that you can have. Um, I think mode. Yeah. So you just simply have them. You set the mode to be turtle dot mode to be logo, and it will be and it'll go and it will the default of new turtles will be. Um, upward but by default we're going to use a standard mode all right other questions for turtles yes sorry why do you i instead of underscore because um that is the way because that is muscle memory at work over there um i so here, when I'm using I, I will change with the values. So um, I will be one. So here, I will be zero, one, and two. We'll learn more about that in in a bit um, when we get to the for loops. And underscore means we just don't care what the val value is, and we don't have a value to change. But most of the time, we care, and most of the time, we use I. A lot of times, because it's short for both integer and index. 
um, which is the most common thing, and we, that's the most common use for that. So you'll see me using I a lot, just out of muscle memory, but really when you don't care, you can use underscore. Um, any other questions about turtles? Yes? Excellent question. I'm not sure off the top of my head, but um, let's see. Ah. So let's see. I think by doing, let's see, BG color, I think. Yeah. So let's see. Can I change that? Yeah. So here, rather than calling a specific turtle, what we do is that we call the module itself. And what, when we do this, when we say turtle dot BG color, we're asking the program to basically um, create some, to basically do something that we've all, we're asking it to use a function that's been, that it was written in there. So let's go ahead and turn this into a hideous looking orange. Actually, it doesn't look too bad. But BG color will change, uh, so turtle.bg color changes the background color. Um, so you may be wondering why we're doing turtles. That might be like, so some of you might be wondering and just too polite to ask, okay, what's the point of this? And the answer is that this gives us a very simple way to interact with graphics. Uh, interacting with graphics in other programming languages is a pain in the neck. A real pain in the neck. Um, it is a pain because you have to create canvases and then you have to create graphic objects and draw on the graphics objects and then call it and then call update and it's just a mess. Here I've just got a turtle who I can just move around. It's intuitive, it's easy, it's sometimes tedious, but it works. And, he co and he'll go very well with learning how to use our if-else statements and our for loops in tandem because we'll learn how to basically do alternative sequences like, okay, pen up and pen down between the moves and then how to automate this stuff, how to draw generalized shapes, those kind of stuff. There are generalized shapes, by the way. Um, Alice.circle is one of them. If I can circle. Um, right, radius, extent, and then s so f this is very interesting. And I think this will be the le a good place to stop after, after we get here um, because it will bring home, home a lot of good points here. So alice.circle, let's go ahead and make a circle of radius 100. Right, and that draws a circle of radius 100 just starting from the top of where she is. So now, um, turtle.clear, let's see what that does. Whoops, turtle.clear, let's see what happens here. Did not do what I expected it to do. All right, let's go ahead and go back over here. So I'm just gonna keep Bob around and all I'm gonna do is, I'm just gonna have him do bob.circle. And if I tell him to do a circle of 200, he'll do that. Now, if you notice, there were two other parameters, though. The two param there were two more parameters I could put in. It said extent. So uh, what if I do 180 here? 200 and 180. So that's how many degrees you want to draw. The extent is, but what the heck is stats? So if we do 360 first off, that should do a full circle. Okay. What the heck if I do like maybe three over here? Wait, what? That's interesting. Right? I told it to do a circle, told it to do a full 360 degrees, and I said, let the steps be three. And it drew a triangle. Uh, specifically, it drew an equilateral triangle, right? Equilateral triangle, again, means that it's the same on all sides. All the angles are the same. The world? Uh, 
four. Okay. That, that looks nothing like a circle, right? Okay, let's go and do six. Guess it, you can guess pretty well that's gonna be a hexagon there if I do six. And then if I do seven, it's gonna be a septagon. Right? And if I do eight, it's gonna be octagon, and if it's gonna be nine, it's gonna be whatever the heck that is, um, and so on and so, so forth. Dodecahan, I think, or something like that? I don't know, right? But point is, is that as the shape goes, as the number of steps goes up, what's going on? It's looking more and more like a circle, right? To the point where if I do like a hundred gone, whatever that is, right? A polygon with a hundred sides. Okay, so we know because we, we wrote this, we know that that is not a circle. It's a 100 gone, right? It's a shape with 100 sides of equal length, right? We know that because we wrote the code that said so, right? And it's more apparent if I make it ginormous, right? Like over here, 1,000, right? It's hard to tell, actually. What's going on here? Uh, oh, fine. Well, sorry? Well, what is going on over here is that um, with, this, with this circle thing, OK. What's going on over here is that actually it's kind of, uh, we're working in a coordinate plane, right? We're working in a coordinate plane of, well, are we working in a coordinate plane of integers? I don't know. But I kept saying pixel. What's a pixel? Excellent question. Glad I asked it. Um, good old Wikipedia. By the way, other classes, especially if you're freshmen, you may have gotten like a lecture about how much Wikipedia is ev evil, especially from your high school teachers or something. Wikipedia is the worst. Don't use Wikipedia. Love Wikipedia. It's the best thing ever. May have to do with the fact that Wikipedia came along when I was in high school, but um, also for computer science topics, like Wikipedia is just the best, uh, like, as we'll learn, uh, bubble sort, right? I mean, come on, it's got animations. It's bloody brilliant. It tells you how to, it tells you how to do these sorting algorithms. It's fantastic. So, um, so for computer science stuff, for some reason, it's actually very good. So pixels, or picture element, okay, that's what I was looking for, is a physical point on a raster image, what the heck's that? Point is, is that basically that if you look at your laptop in front of you, uh, if we were to zoom in, this is what each of those little squares looks like. Right? This triad over here is a pixel. This RG, uh, this red, green, blue is a pixel. Put them to light them up in a certain intensity, you get a color. Right? So, and if you get really close to your screen, although you, we have Apple to blame for this, you can't really, it's very hard to see the pixels unless you get really close right now. Um, that's both a good thing and a bad thing, right? If you've got a small laptop like me, 14 inch screen, 10 EP, you probably won't be able to see the individual pixels unless you get really close up there. But on the other hand, if you've got a bigger screen that's 1080p, then like a 15 or 17 inch, you can probably see it. But that individual pixel is basically the, is basically, rep, we can, con, the computer can control that pixel, okay? And it can set that pixel to one specific color, right? Um, also, monitors will have like a hertz rate. So like if you've got a 60 hertz monitor, it can set uh, every pixel in that thing on your monitor uh, to a new color at 60 hertz. Hertz being, once a, being per second. So if it has a refresh rate of 60 hertz, that means that it can change 60 times a second, which is pretty cool. Um, so these things change color fast. It gives the appearance of animation. When in fact, essentially what's going on with your computer is like one of those little flip books where they each have a little drawing on the next page. 
That's what's kind of going on in terms of animation. Uh, it's just lights turning on really off, on and off really quickly. So how does that get back into here? Well, at some point, the sides just get too small to draw. We can't actually draw a real circle, like because at some point it's going to get jagged like this over here. At some point, it's going to become jagged. So we can just approximate it. And that's a lot of what happens in computers, uh, in computer science. A lot of times, we can't actually, we're stopped by like physical limitations or stuff. But the approximations for like shapes and stuff are perfectly fine. Um, so, you know, having 100 gone for a circle, perfectly fine. You ask a person, is it 100 gone or a circle? They're going to go, what's 100 gone? It's a circle. Right, let's go ahead and shrink this down. I'm going to put this down to maybe uh, 200 radius. And we're going to make it a 50 gone. Or maybe a 25 gone. This will get the point across, I think. Uh, there we go. We can start seeing the sides again. Right? One, two, three, four, five. I'm not going to count them all, but if you're so inclined, you can count them. But there's 25 sides there. But especially the further back you are, the more they blur together. Um, and that's what's going on here. So to draw an actual circle, it's just a choosing an arbitrarily high number. Right? And you can see it's kind of jagged in some places. And that's just because of the way pixels work. Now, the way it gets around, a lot of computers get around this, like because you're sure, because I'm sure you've like, you're like, I've seen things. Things on my screen look crisp. They aren't jagged. Well, that's where you get things, cool things like anti-aliasing going on, where basically that it will take, um, where it will take an image like this and the pixels in the image like this and <coughs> render them and smooth them out a bit, right? Anyway, so point being is that the pixels are the way, are, are basically, we get this kind of control uh, over the pixels by doing this. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'll assign some readings for t the turtles, play around, and just give you incentive to play around with them this e weekend. What we'll do in the next week is that we're going to learn about our, um, let's see, in the next coming weeks, we're going to learn about, yeah, so I'll assign like drawing cir uh, circles with a turtle. And what we're going to learn over the next week is sequences. So getting into the stuff being able to do things with computer science. So dealing with strings and lists and tuples and going through strings. And then finally we'll learn the for loop and we're going to all tie it together. All right.